Nate. Welcome back. Welcome back, Daniel. It's another year. So episode 101, we've now been at this just over two years. Mm-hmm. And we were kind of looking at the back catalog and thinking, what are we going to do as we start the new year? And we were thinking of topics that we've never covered before. And <laughs> actually in doing that, I totally, I suggested what we're going to talk about today but totally missed that 80 episodes back, we did do an episode on giving performance reviews to your team. Do you remember that one, Nate? I, I do. Yeah. Well, no, I didn't. But 80 episodes back, that's because 80 episodes back is a long time <laughs> in podcast so time. <laughs> Absolutely. So we went back and looked at the calendar and we found it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you found it. I, I had totally missed it. So anyway, so I thought, well, maybe we don't do it. But then I thought, well, I'm sure... We've probably changed our thoughts on these over the last two years, or at least developed them more. And so in talking about this episode, we came to the agreement that, you know what, that previous episode, which was episode 20, by the way, definitely go check it out. Uh, Mm. There are things that have developed since then, and there are different thoughts that we had. Maybe, Nate, let's get started here and, and, um, and, and maybe talk a little bit about because you would actually went back and listened to that episode. Maybe I listened to the whole start. thing. Yeah, yeah, just with some reflections on that or or, or things that, that uh, you realized in watching that. Of course, we'll do that in a second, but welcome back to the podcast, everyone. I'm Daniel. This is Nate. This is the Seven Figure Music School podcast. And in this podcast, we it is our goal to kind of lay bare the things that we've learned over the years in running our own schools and working with music school owners, even Seven Figure School owners, uh, things that we've learned so that you can run a fun mission driven school. Um, having said that, Nate, maybe let's get going by you sharing some of the things that you noticed from that episode or just thought things that really stood out to you. Here are just a handful of highlights. What impressed me about this? Number one, I just loved your method, dude. Start, stop, continue. I love the simplicity of it. I had kind of forgotten that that's your version of it. And, Mm -hmm. um, I just, I was like, hmm, it actually, I so enjoyed listening to you talk about start, stop, continue and the value. By the way, I've heard that described as rose, thorn, rose, this idea, or like the compliment sandwich, like so compliment, Mm. critique, compliment. I've heard like different versions of this, but it really actually made me think, and we'll talk about this a little bit more about maybe reconsidering how I do it at BMF and adopting um, your start, stop, continue method. Uh, Secondly, I was just kind of blown away when you said, I do this in 30 minutes with my team members. This idea of a performance, I was like, wow, that's, I struggle, as you know, because we've been doing a lot of these apps together. I really, you really have to work me hard to get me to stop talking. So I really struggle with the idea of being able to do this efficiently in 30 minutes. So I was impressed by that. Um, And... I think that like another takeaway was that when at one point we were talking about how many one can handle. In other words, I brought him Mm. uh, Ben as our private lesson director and I talked about him being the one who does performance reviews with the private lesson teachers. And it's more important that I do a performance review with him. So I do the performance review with directors. And what's interesting to me upon reflection on this was just that how hard it is to remember that you kind of want to have your hands on everything in your company or everyone. And in reality, that's not probably a healthy way to Mm. grow team. It's really valuable, for example, for a director of your private lesson program or, um, you know, your school manager to be handling some of those reviews rather than you doing all of them. Um, I couple more takeaways and I'm going to popcorn to you and see what you thought about it um, when you were reflecting on this, but I loved how much we hammered this idea that performance reviews with your team are linked to your annual planning. If you don't have, and you said this really well in that that episode, you said, if we don't have a very clear objective already stated as a company, then how are you supposed to suggest what they could do differently? That's not just about them, Instead of what we're actually talking about is what's it going to take as a team, right, to achieve this thing? 
this isn't like I'm not doing like a personal performance review of you, Daniel, when we do ours. This is like, hey, what do we want to try to do with the 7FMS podcast? What are we trying to achieve in, in you know, in, in, in the case of this year, 2024? And so what do we what do I want you to continue doing? What would be, be nice for you to start doing? And what would be a couple of things to stop doing that I think would increase our chances of achieving this? goal, right? Mm -hmm. So I love that we talked about that and made it clear that it's very hard to do performance reviews if you don't have any sort of objective yet for your school. Um, anyways, my last takeaway was that in the episode, we really did a good job of talking about how simple this can be to do. And my thought was like, when we get to the confessional part here of this, Daniel, I was like, why is this still so hard for me to fit in? To the year. Mm. I'm like, we, the way we describe these reviews, it really does seem like it should be quite doable for any music school owner to facilitate. And then I thought, Nate, mm. why is it still hard for me year after you year to make sure that we get these done? Um, those were my takeaways right out of the gate. And yes, I did listen mm. to the entire app and take notes immediately following the listen. How about you, Daniel? Thoughts? Yeah, I do have some thoughts. First off, like kind of to contextualize because we came into this episode kind of hot. Like usually we have maybe a little bit more of a kind of like a teaching feel to the podcast. But I think with this one, the reason even to bring this up as the first episode back after we took a little bit of a break is that the beginning of the year is the time historically when I'm kind of scrambling saying, I'm scrambling in the business saying, oh yeah, let's let's get all those things done that I probably should have done in November and December of last year. And that has been my personal story for quite a long time. You know, even some years, not even getting around the annual planning until March. Now that's been a while back. Yeah, totally. That has been my story. But part of the reason that's been my story, and I think people listening probably can relate to this, is that there is a connection between the delay on the things I quote unquote should be doing and how important they are to me, or to say it a different way, how much connection there is to the actual reality of running the business that year. In other words, yes, when I was delaying doing the annual planning or not doing it all, I didn't see a lot of connection between the actual results of the business and that process. Therefore, there was no motivation to do it. Looking back, I see the same thing with things like performance reviews. And I think end of the year, beginning of the new year is a good time to review some of these topics. And, you know, the last two years we did annual planning at the beginning, uh, an annual planning episode. This year we thought, hey, let's let's give that one a break for a while. Let's maybe go right. to this one and, and review you know, comments that we made in the past and even dig in a little bit deeper and talk about some things that we didn't in a previous episode or episodes. So that's kind of the first thought, the relevance, mm. why you want to continue listening to this episode, you know, if you're listening yeah. or if you're watching on YouTube. So that's the first thing. Second thing, a big thing that stood out to me about this previous episode, and this is, I'm not just going to rehash what we said there. This is what really stands out to me. And then you just made a comment about it too, which kind of changes how I'm going to talk about it even in the moment. But you were kind of marveling at the simplicity of the start, stop, continue system. Yep. But for me, this comes down to what I would call a challenge that I've experienced in the past and honestly, I'm even experiencing right now, mm. which is there are all these topics you're supposed to know about. There's all these things you're supposed to know about as a business owner, these things you're supposed to do to run the business, to make it profitable, to make it successful. We weren't yeah. taught those things. We had to self-educate. And, you know, for those who've been listening for a long time, and we do have a lot of really faithful listeners, and we really appreciate you. For those who've listened for a long time, they know that my backstory is that I just got obsessed with marketing about 10 years ago, you know, 12, mm. 10 to 12 years ago. That's not a bad thing to get obsessed with. It makes it pretty simple to become good at lead generation. It makes it pretty simple to to drive 
some of those early processes that are most crucial for a business, delivering sales, delivering revenue so the company can grow. Mm. When I did that, I created this problem where I then overextended myself because now I, because I made the company grow or companies, because this was a pattern across a couple of different projects I was involved in. All of a sudden now I'm doing way too much. And I had to shift my focus from marketing and sales to management and team and scaling and systems. Yeah. And I didn't know what I was doing. And so as I started hiring team, I, I again, this is what happened. I would get to March of, of the year and, you know, I, I literally would have team members saying to me, hey, I've been working for you for like a year and a half now. Like, we're going to do any kind of performance yeah. view or, or things like that. And so I'm going to Google and like, okay, what do I do for performance reviews? Like, where's the book on this? Where's the course on this? Cause that always been my pattern in the past. Here's how I've educated yeah. myself, but I felt like I was really under the gun. And so as a result, what I did was did really simple things. So you kind of marveled at the simplicity of it. Mm. But for me, it was actually a reaction to the fact that I had no idea what I was doing and it seemed yes. to work. Okay. But, and just even, even, you know, being really transparent here, even that episode, which we did about two years ago now, even then I was earlier in my process of getting comfortable with that. And of course we've been doing it now for several years since then, but I had the best of intentions of following up on the start, stop continues and quarterly things like that. But even in those yes. early years, I wasn't quite as faithful at it. Yeah. And there was always a thought in the back of my head that I thought I could be doing this better, but I'm just not sure how, how can I be doing this better? And I still ask these questions about a, a wide variety of things across the business now, including, you know, this area. And one of the things that we're working on here in 2024 is shoring up more of that team component just across mm -hmm. the, the businesses that I'm running, such as Grow Your Music Studio, um, and the, all the team that's involved there, grouplessons.com, which is a sponsor of this podcast. If you're looking for a great group lesson system uh, that can be run multi-level or leveled, and is honestly, just being really, really honest, really blunt, really a superior group lesson system to anything else that's available out there, go check out grouplessons.com. Mm -hmm. But I'm running the mm -hmm. team there as well, and I'm trying to make it a fun environment for people a satisfying environment, a stable and secure environment, and one where people feel appreciated, not just in their day-to-day -day interactions, which I think I excel at, but also, and this is there where I don't necessarily excel at, mm. uh, being really thorough in an area of the business that probably doesn't get as much attention as it needs, simply because we're not yet at a stage where we have an entire HR department or an, a person is entirely dedicated to to this sort of thing. Um, yeah. So... Yeah, that's my confession. You know, looking back at that episode, I I still believe in that system, but I think there are improvements that can be made to connect the things that are talked about there to the 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 day to day. And there are some things that maybe we'll talk about later in the episode. There are some things that we're doing additionally now, but but yeah, that's kind of my thought. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or admonishment or coaching you yeah. on me, but there it is. No. Well, I just, let me highlight a few things. One thing we did really well in that episode is you were um, waxing on eloquently about your system and how you got there, et cetera. And I really appreciate your comment, Daniel, around just like, hey, I'm good. Like so many things, I'm going to have to self-educate, right? So you're talking about like, you know, literally Googling the thing. I mean, how many times this week alone am I going to Google a, an idea? Like I just did yesterday. We're talking about surveying our faculty because we're trying to gather a bunch of information so that we make a, an annual plan that really takes into account all of their needs, wants, desires, pain points, et cetera. And I was just like, man, I don't know if the survey we've been using the last four years is really that good. And I'm Googling how to survey better, you know, like mm. these things, like just how to ask a better question, et cetera. Um, but highlighting something that you said there uh, around, and I want to, I want to make sure we, our listeners hear this is that 
I've been working with you for two, three, I don't even know how many years. Really? Three years, right? Technically four. We met at the end of 2019. Yes. Okay, good. So four years. Wow. And one of the things I really appreciate about working with you, Daniel, is your ability to get things done day to day. I think of it more as week to week working together. And you're really, really strong in that area. And it's really beneficial to someone like me because sometimes I'm too, like, everything is just like, what's a new great idea? You know, and I need, I really need, it, it works well to work with you to be thinking about, okay, dude, let's just, what needs to happen to create great podcasts for our listeners? Okay, love it. So, but I love how you're linking this to things that are actually more quarterly and annually and beyond within our business. So for example, the HR department, there are very real pressing needs that happen in any week or month. For example, your marketing person leaves and you're like, oh, well, if I don't replace this person, guess who's doing it? I'm doing all those website updates, et cetera, right? Or, <laughs> you know, those things happen, right? That's part of but in actuality, generally with around HR, it's the kind of thing that you just sort of improve year each year. You try to make it a little bit better. You try to make your hiring funnel a little bit better. You try to make your onboarding a little bit more um, thorough. You try to make, um, and what we're talking about today, you try to implement things like performance reviews in a consistent manner so that your team can bank on getting that, having that open, transparent conversation at least once a year. You try to improve it, but you don't improve it every single quarter. It's not like every month we're just going to make this way better. It's just more of an annual thing. So I appreciate in your confessional part this idea that um, most of our time is working in the business day to day, week to week, and ensuring that we're actually getting the things done so we can deliver a great lesson to every one of our students or whatever um, your evidence of success is. Um, and I like to think of it as 80-20. 20% of the time, I'm working on those strategic goals. I'm working on what's that long-term improvement I want to show at the end of this year. So I appreciate that piece of it. And when I was listening to this idea of performance reviews, it really struck me. Here's my one of my confessional points is that I have sort of in the last couple of years fallen back into a pattern which I don't love, which is where I want to have my hands in everything. I want to be interested in every bucket of the business all the time. And in so doing, I'm actually, it's like, I'm interested in everything, therefore I'm impacting nothing. Right? It's like, um, and so one of the ways that I can be more impactful, you know, as a colleague at Brooklyn Music Factory and as someone who coaches quite a bit is to actually be interested in just a handful of employees that I can do reviews with and coach and then empower them, like I was saying before, to be interested in their uh, teachers or staff that they're working with. So one, that's just a micro confession right now is that looking ahead to this year and looking ahead to doing performance reviews, I'm stating out loud on the air to our listeners that I'm going to focus on fewer people that I can be more beneficial to and allow them through the modeling of me focusing on them, allow them to be impactful with the people that they are doing performance reviews with, right? So that's my, that's my first reflection on your reflection confessional. Thoughts, Daniel? Well, you heard it here first. Don't pay attention to all your team members. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> But it, it's, it, it's really, it's really fantastic. Right, I know, I know. Well, I, gosh, I mean, I could really go off on one particular thing you said there. It would kind of veer us off the course of talking about performance reviews, but I, I really hear what you're saying there. And, well, why not? Maybe let's go there. There's there's really two things there. Yeah, yeah. the uh, focusing on, I can't remember where I heard this. 
fewer better things. Mm. I mean, Naval Ravikant said it. It sounds like something he'd say. But focusing on fewer, better things. It, it's how you build leverage. It's how it's how you actually focus and work on the things that truly, truly matter. And I was slapped in the face with this at the end of 2023 as I felt really overextended at the end of the year, really overextended. Mm. Um, it, it really was hitting me in the face like in November and December of 2023 just because th- we had some really good business results in 23 in both businesses. And I did find myself in that place. When Peter Thiel says in zero to one, if you're doing the same job six months from now, that you were doing six months ago, um, you you are mismanaging your business, and ooh, that, mm. that that hits hard. But I think that then goes into a second thing that I'm hearing you say, and again, it's a little bit off topic, but why not go there? Because I think it can be helpful. Um, what you do have to take seriously, and what you don't have to take seriously in the business. Um. I'm just thinking about the fact that here you're talking about focusing on fewer employees and really driving your effort into those people. And I'm thinking about why is it that I've been able to quote unquote get away with maybe having a, a, a light version of a performance review system, mm. but yet we posted some of our best business results ever in 2023. Why is that? Mm. Well, because there are areas of your business that you, that you can neglect or maybe only give half power to and, and you keep the plane flying. But there are some critical systems that if you lose those systems, you're going down in flames, right? And, mm. I, and I'm really cognizant of that because, you know, I had some clients at the end of 23 where, you know, we were doing work for their school and they were experiencing challenges and those challenges were around some of those critical systems where they were really feeling the burn. They were really feeling the heat. I probably wouldn't go to those people and say, oh, you really need to focus on your performance review system. <laughs> Not when all the lights are going red in the cockpit. You don't say that. This is one of those areas that you probably can do a light version of this and when things are going well in the business, then you can take your eye off some of these other systems that you have running smoothly, put your focus here and say, hmm, maybe maybe we get better because now we have the bandwidth to focus on this because we had all these leads contact us this month. Our retention is high. Our teachers are feeling happy. We're not having a teacher retention problem, not having a student retention problem. So now let's look at some of these systems that have been on my back burner list or as David Allen calls it, the someday maybe list. I, I do think there are areas of business mm-hmm. that you can kind of under uh, up to a certain point, you don't have to focus on them as much. And this is probably one of them. Having said that we're doing a whole episode on it, kind of, <laughs> and there is importance to it. I do think there, if you have team, there needs to be some version of this, but you know, maybe it's uh Maybe it's not. Maybe as simple as, yeah. Well, may, just maybe it's not one of your top five systems that absolutely has to be running for your business to be okay. You know, it's okay if it's a little light. I'm curious, because I have a different, I feel a mm. little bit different on this. Uh, but I'm curious if we were to go back to your systems that must be in place. Daniel, what would you, like thinking about some of the client's that you've been coaching some of the other school owners and you think like, hey, let's get these top five systems to a predictive state before we move on to some back burner lists. What do you have a any version of a list in your mind where you're like, set these up first, then move on to these? Oh yeah. I think I I want to summarize this, not go really deep on it. Yeah, yeah. I think we've talked about it in some fashion many times over the course of the last hundred episodes or so. Yep. So I think everyone has to start with some sort of personal productivity and organization system so that nothing slips through the cracks. So many clients I've got within 23 
so many clients I worked with in 23, they had, they felt time poor, but they actually weren't. They just were mismanaging the use of their time. And I'd just say, if anyone kind of resonates with that, just, you know, reply to the email you got this in or reach out on social media. Like I, I help clients with this all the time and they just become these as, uh, you know, productivity ninjas, so to speak. Okay. So that's one, two marketing and sales. Three, the product has to be good. I might actually put product at two <clears throat> because good product makes marketing a lot easier. Mm. So product, mm. <clears throat> typically, you know, if product is going well, if retention's high, that that's a good sign. Mm. Um, I, I was speaking with a, with a teacher back in October of last year and we were talking about retention, talking about retention and, and. They were asking me a lot of questions that were tactical. Ooh, what do we do? What do we do? What do, you know? And I started digging deeper than just the tactical level. And I asked them about their students' results on an individual basis. And they mentioned, oh, yeah, well, they're passing about one song a week. And I just said, <laughs> whoa, 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 stop. Let's stop talking about attendance bracelets. Let's stop talking about you know, having like parties every quarter, you know, to increase school loyalty. Let's talk about the fact that the students are learning one song a week. Mm. That, that's a huge indicator of a problem. People don't quit something that's going well. And mm. I didn't have to do a lot of that extra nonsense that has become mm. advice that's kind of standard in the industry. I didn't have to do all that stuff because kids were passing a lot of music every week. People don't quit when, when the core of the product is working really, really well. And conversely, number three, marketing becomes a lot easier. The marketing and sales and retention thing, conversion rates and all that stuff get this tailwind behind them and, and it kind of solves those problems. So yeah, I would just say personal habits, productivity, product, Marketing and sales retention; those are kind of the big four that that I think are the things you just can't take your eye off the ball on. There has to be a level of discipline in those areas. There has to be systems in place for those areas. It's very rare that I meet a school owner that's doing all of those things and isn't having an out outrageous success. Let me link this then to our performance review. Oh, I love it. Okay, so I like, yeah, I put, I put this as number, your number two after, by the way, personal productivity, when you're talking about helping people become productivity ninjas, it almost sounds like you're doing a version of a performance review. You're like, here's what I'd like you to start. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I order them. So you're just like, a, yeah, what, like, right. Um, but then when we go to product, um, this is what I wrote in my notes under product. I wrote, okay, so let's say you're a piano school and you teach pri only private piano lessons. Your product is twofold, is made up of two components, right? Plus some added like frosting and sparkles, okay? But the main component is, do you have a methodology and a curriculum that you know and trust, right? The second part is, do you have people that understand the methodology and curriculum that you know and trust mm -hmm. that are teaching it, right? So um, this is where that performance review comes in. And we talk about this in F20 briefly in terms of how we measure success with our teachers at Brooklyn Music Factory. In an ongoing way, we say, hey, number one, communicate consistently. Every one of our teachers needs to send a lesson report within 24 hours. Um, and within that lesson report, you can be, which gets us to number two, you need to ensure that you're sharing lesson resources. And um, for example, in our case, since we're a curriculum company, we're, you know, we have big music games, we have, uh, you know, our, our songwriters journey, et cetera, a whole number of pieces of curriculum that we use, you need to be sharing Brooklyn Music Factory specific curriculum with them, right? So number one, are you communicating consistently? Number two, are you sharing the resource, right? So, um, which by the way, I'm sorry, I mentioned, I should say, Big Music Games is, an is another one of our sponsors here of the podcast. 
So if you're interested in playing the games yourself or adopting this methodology in your lesson plans, uh, you can just go to bigmusicgames.com um, backslash 7FMS, that's the number, 7FMS, and you can start playing these games today in your lessons 100% free. So bigmusicgames.com backslash 7FMS, check it out. So number two with the teachers is we're saying, are you sharing those resources, right? And then number three, a measure of success is, does your student know who they're going to be collaborating with on the gig, i.e., are you building community? So when I talk about the people, do we know and trust the people? This is where the performance review comes in, Daniel. We're saying, hey, it's not just here's a great lesson book, like in the, in the case of... Um, you know, uh, in the case of group lessons, it's not just here's Piano Express, here's this proven methodology, just use it. It's ensure that you're using it in a consistent and thorough manner, right? And that's where the performance review comes in. If we want to deliver consistently on product, that's, you know, a bucket number two, delivering on promise, then we need to ensure that we have both the methodology and the curriculum that we know and trust well. So that gets to our training piece and making choices as an owner. Um, but then number two, are we hiring and onboarding and consistently giving feedback to the people that are actually delivering the service? Because if we're in a music school, we are in the people business. The curriculum itself means nothing if it's not well facilitated by people. That's my thought in terms of your number two on your systems and how we link it to a performance review. Nate, then that, that just brings me to something you said, which is it, if it's so crucial, why, the cha why have you felt the challenge to be consistent with these over the last mm -hmm. couple of years? Well, I mentioned this in app 20, but I'm going to say it out loud here again because it's important for me to say often. I tend to overcomplicate things, Daniel. And I think it's in um, my desire. I think it has somehow linked to my, like the creative muscle that I've been flexing for so long, I end up thinking that I need a dozen different solutions for one pro problem, right? And as a result, I start sort of like stacking ideas on top of ideas. Um, the second thing is, is that it's been a struggle for me, Daniel, because um, in my, you know, both you and I share this, just this like, like a massive curiosity. Like we're always like, what's the next book we're going to read? You know, what are you, you're sending me things to check out. I'm sharing some, some quote from something that I love. And in, as a result, um, I adopted originally a system that was just far too, um, involved for a company our size. We could mm -hmm. maintain operationally um, all the paperwork and all the boxes we had to check and all of the organization that we had to do around this performance review. Um, and it was a 360 review where we had like, you know, 25 employees all filling out a review about one person to get 25 perspectives. And it was just too much. Wow. Yeah, it was like way more than I needed to do. And just because I learned it from some sort of corporate template that said it should, we should do it this way doesn't mean that it actually works within the Brooklyn Music Factory ecosystem, right? Hmm. This the third thing, and this is the intro, this is my true confessional moment, is that, and I mentioned that I was didn't need to do reviews of everyone. I needed to do reviews of those that I was working directly with in in our leadership team. So I'm going to include, you know, Jessica as the director of families and communication, Pira as the director of camp. Ben is the director of our private lessons. Like those are actually the big three for me. They're the ones when I lead my weekly leadership team uh, meeting, they show up, right? Um, so I here's the confessional moment is that, you know, Jessica's my wife. It's hard to do a 360 review with your wife that's really focused just on the job site, right? Um, secondly, Pira is my co-founder. We've been working together for 14 years, right? Um, ben also was here on day one that the school started. So in truth, there's a little bit of me that's like, 
uh, we already are so open with one another about different things. Do we really need to do this formal review? And part of that, um, you know, this is like the coaching moment. This is where you'd be really, you are beneficial with me, is that there's a little aversion there. I'm like, I'm kind of avoiding, avoiding the thing. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that's my last piece on it is that like, the people that truly matter, I've known for a long time, and sometime, in some case, cases, um, yeah, more than half my life. And so, it's hard to do these kind of things with those people if I, if I'm, if there's a little bit of fear baked into it. And so, that's one of the things that I'm changing right now is just understanding that they all three, and you mentioned this well, and and before, but but your team wants to have the feedback and wants to give the feedback, they want it. And that includes, um, you know, my business partner, right? So that's my last piece of the confessional is there's a little bit of me that's like, ah, after all these years, do we really need to do this? Plus I'm a little bit, I mean, we're working pretty well. You know, we're a seven figure music school doing great, serving hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of families every year, it's probably good enough. But really, that's just an avoidance. It's a fear moment for me. Well, let's go through those in, in order. Uh, I want to jump to your number two. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting to me. And I think three is really interesting to get into. I'm not ignoring what you just said there, but let's just go in order. Number two yeah. almost feels like the opposite of what I said. Whereas I just picked something that was simple because I could implement it fast because the plane needs to land and I'm building the runway gear, like when we're <laughs> yeah, at 5,000 feet, right? You kind of yeah. went the other way and we're like, oh, let's just pull something off the shelf. And there wasn't a, there wasn't, it wasn't a good fit for who you were as a business. And yeah. I'm not going to sit here and criticize a decision you made, you know, five, 10 years ago. I just want to point out that there's nothing wrong with picking the wrong marketing system review system, annual planning system, do something. And then you're going to learn a lot yeah. by doing the wrong thing. And then you, you, then you know better what you're going to need for version two. It just always works that way. It's always so cliche. I feel embarrassed saying it again on the podcast, but yes, I keep seeing the same problem come up with clients week after week, month after month where they're, you know, they're pondering, they're, they're delaying, they're trying to find the perfect solution. Heck, I was guilty of that in 2023 more than once. So I know it's an ongoing encouragement and admonishment that we all need. Mm. I would just say that, you know, Daniel maybe went a little underpowered. Nate went a little overpowered. There's probably something good in the middle. And I would just say mm. to, to kind of go back to what you said about getting things done. I don't yeah. use David Allen's full getting things done system. There are aspects of his system that weren't all that helpful to me. And then there are aspects of his rule set or his guidelines for in the system that I've actually gone even deeper than what he suggested because I fit it for who I was as a person. I think you can do that for the performance review system mm -hmm. as well. I just wanted to point that out, that there is probably some happy medium and either A, you can get it out of the box or you can take like 80 to 90% of something that works for a business of your size and then with use, you get a little bit better at it. So that's, I think, my address mm -hmm. for number two there. Number three, this aversion to doing reviews around certain people in the business. Yeah. Here's my question for you, Nate. Mm hmm Oh. <laughs> Why are you feeling aversion? What is it you're actually feeling there? I think there's two things. Number one, I'm like, well, we've been working together for 14 years. Right. Surely we already know everything about one another and how we operate. We're just going to hear the same thing again, which I know is right. ridiculous because we're always changing and growing. So um, that's number one. But then number two, there's a little bit of like, truthfully, Daniel, there's a little bit um, of I don't want to rock the boat too much by giving a stock to the, yeah, giving clear feedback to them. I can certainly take the feedback and welcome it. At least I... At least I think I can can challenge me on that after I get it, but um, nice. but there's a little bit of me not really wanting to give that feedback 
um, because they're such a long-standing, trusted member of the team. Like, what if I rock the boat too much? Okay. So the first so, version, would you say it's one of efficiency, where you kind of feel aversion because it's like, oh, we don't really need it. It's a waste of time. Is that a good description of the first aversion? Yeah, efficiency, because I'm, well, what if I just hear the same thing that we shared last year or the year before? It's probably, don't we know one another so well? Let's just save the time and just keep getting stuff done because we're just going to hear the same feedback. Got it. Okay. The second aversion, would you say that that's what, well, I mean, you actually called it out. You said, I don't want to rock the boat too much. What's interesting about the two of those together is that, mm -hmm. It would seem to me that hmm. with ongoing meetings with each one of those people where the objectives are clear about what the business is supposed to do, an annual review probably shouldn't bring something way out of left field. Like there shouldn't be a stop that right. suddenly got brought up at the annual review. So ongoing communication with a team member would solve that problem. And then you probably can have a lighter version of an annual review uh, because you are ongoingly keeping track of their personal objectives and their role. But here's what's interesting to me, Nate. I know you already do all those things, don't you? I do, but it's what's cool about that last point, Daniel, is it's making me think maybe in my ongoing weekly leadership check-ins or my monthly, like, how's our how you know uh, progress on goals maybe i'm not actually addressing those in quite the right way in other words maybe i'm uh not being very succinct and clear as to what's working and what isn't in terms of achieving our goals and hitting our deadlines um and so as a result i'm actually sort of muddying the waters month to month and then when it gets to the performance review, almost, Daniel, like, I have to save up for the annual review to say, how come we didn't hit that deadline? I want us to start hitting deadlines, right? So it's interesting because your point is making me con reconsider some of our project management and how I'm leading those meetings monthly in terms of, like, maybe I'm missing something there. So just to sort of state the obvious for our listeners... What I love about it is that this performance review, as you mentioned before, is linked so closely to your annual plan and how you're progressing on it that we can really learn about both sides of these, this coin. You know, it's like okay. two sides of the same coin. You know, how right. people are performing and what your plan is around what you're trying to achieve with the people. I think this is a good place to bring this full circle and talk about the specifics and then even some things that I see on the horizon as things I want to add to the system. So one, with my people, mm. I do have, especially with the most important ones, so to speak, I have weekly meetings with them. Yeah. Two, they owe me a list at the beginning of each month of what their objectives are for the month, every month. And they're, yeah, they're yeah. telling me. And that allows me to compare that to the business's overall goals, which we decided again as a team at the beginning of the year. And it helps me align it with developments that have happened in the business throughout the year. So that's that ongoing check-in piece and the clarity of, oh, you've got to write this down and you owe it to me. There's a deadline on when you have to get that list to me. Additionally, I have quarterly check-ins. And again, this is all just automated within our task management system. I don't even have to prompt them for this. It just shows up quarterly for them where they answer six questions every quarter about decisions that need to be made unacceptable things they're noticing in the business. Um, you know, uh, well, I'm not going to get at all that. That could be its own episode. But th Dang. there's there's just this ongoing communication and accountability to the larger goals that's happening throughout the year. And then let's just get back to the idea of what should be on the performance review. I think start, stop, continue is a little underpowered. Where I'm seeing a failure in in this is... What's the connection between a performance review and how they're compensated? We haven't even talked about that in this episode up here anymore. But 
how do I know how well they're performing? And where I feel like I've done not done as well is what are the actual categories I'm measuring them in? And I think mm-hmm. that's where we, well, what's important to us? You know, is it, uh, and I think that's going to be personal to each organization, but I know for us, since we're a distributed team, communication is really, really important. I'm going to be rating my employees on how well they communicate, how fast they get back to me, like those sorts of things. How well are they doing their projects? Stuff like that. So that's where I'm spending a little bit more time thinking like, okay, how, how do, how do I measure that so that we don't get to the end of the year? And it's just like, okay, I guess everybody gets a raise, you know? Um, Mm, Yes. How, how do we measure? So actually (laughs) shocker. Hey, 50 minutes in, how are we actually measuring performance? (laughs) You know? Um, So I don't know. I think some of the things I said there kind of address the issues that you were talking about, especially on your point three, but then also yeah. actually letting everyone listen who's listening now that we're this deep into the episode, actually tell them like, hey, here's things that you should be doing throughout the year that make the performance review time not this monumental monolithic event that feels really heavy and feels uh, really out of the ordinary no, it's just another meeting and maybe there's a little more weight on it, but no no, no team member or employee should get to the performance review and be shocked by something that you say. It yeah. should have been coming up throughout the year. They should be able to self-assess their yes. own performance and know what's going on. You know, I'm, I'm rereading a performance improvement plan from 2017. I just pulled up out of my G drive and, um, and it says... Um, Performance improvement plan. What objectives do you plan to tackle? We said this quarter, but that's the overcomplication. Should have just been this year. Please name each one and do not exceed four. And so in this case, um, this person named, you know, uh, be a servant, lead by providing tools and systems and inspiring for use and implementation. Okay, well, that's pretty abstract. So then what are the three action steps you're going to do for number one? They wrote, I will host and record two webinars per month. I will record one department mini clinic per week, and I will attend 15-minute weekly check-ins with PL faculty. So back to you, back to your comment about how do you measure performance, what's amazing, so this is 2017, I just pulled up a PDF of this, and it was written by this, by the perform the person who was designing their personal improvement plan. I can simply ask in my check-in with them monthly, well, how's it going? Are you able to take those action steps? Were you able to attend weekly, 15 minute weekly check-ins with your faculty, with the faculty? And if they're like, no, actually that's way too much, then that's a conversation, right? So I think like these shouldn't be a surprise. It shouldn't be at the end of the year I ask how did it go, right? Cause then it just becomes a shocker and maybe I'm afraid to even ask the question. Because I've already right. seen it. It's not like it's a surprise to us how it's going because we're already living within the same environment, working in the same place, seeing one another, benefiting from their improvement, right? Um, that's a good place to wrap, I think, too, on it. Um, I'm sure we have more confessionals, Daniel, but uh, I would just state out loud a, it's a system, as you pointed out. B, there's an annual review, and if you want the exact review, just go back to episode 20 and listen to sort of the system that Daniel used and listen to the version I use. It's easy. It's not complicated. And then C, it's linked to, as you put put it, your annual plan and how you're checking in on that monthly and weekly. And if you kind of align those three things to your last point a couple, like five minutes ago, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be something that you're testing and then improving on, which is the point of this reflective episode, because you and I are both reflecting on what we've tried.